one of the things about cliches is they become cliches for a reason. Usually they express some kind of profound truth. What about that cliche that says, great minds think alike? Well, that's not always so great, is it? Scientific consensus, so-called, it can be dangerous. That's why on this edition of Great Minds with Michael Medved, I, uh, I'm glad to speak with uh, Jay Richards. He and I are both uh, involved with, Jay is a senior fellow at Discovery Institute, uh, where we try to bring a very diverse array of guests who don't necessarily think alike and who certainly don't necessarily feel the same way about the idea of consensus in the sciences. Uh, Jay, you've just written a very controversial piece for American Enterprise mm -hmm. Institute which people, by the way, can read for themselves on our website, mindswithmedved.com. That's mindswithmedved.com. The basic argument of the piece is that uh, scientific consensus mm. can actually be dangerous. It can. All right. So let's make clear from the outset, this doesn't mean that all scientific consensus is out the window. Absolutely. Uh, for instance... I, and I, I do have to share this with you because we did uh, Conspiracy Day. We oh, do right. Conspiracy Day every yeah. month. This last Conspiracy mm -hmm. Day, we were dominated by callers who were questioning the scientific consensus uh, that rejects a flat earth. They they believe there's a whole movement yeah, out there. there. It's all over the internet. I've seen this. Okay. This is not a dangerous scientific no, consensus, not. is there? That And no. by the way, there is consensus that the Earth is round. Absolutely. I mean, and the thing about the, the consensus that the Earth is round is not a modern scientific consensus. Educated people in the West have known this, at least since Aristotle. <laughs> uh, you know, and so it's not like it was a, so, this is not a conspiracy from the 1970s. By, by the way, do you have any sense? What is going on? The, there were seemingly sane-sounding yes. people who were calling the show yeah. one after another. Who are talking about the Earth is flat? I think what's happening is this is the long tail of the information superhighway. We are highly connected, and so one kind of crazy crank that would just be talking to himself can now can create an audience, right? And so it maybe it's one out of a million people that listen to him. But this is one of the one of the costs of our connectivity is that uh, these very strange sort of habits and intellectual proclivities can, can sort of find a life of their own. I don't think this one is likely to live very long. But you're absolutely right. I mean, of course. For most things, right? We tr we have to trust the experts, and so we trust the experts simply because we live in an age of specialization, and because sometimes things are right that people agree with something because they've come to general agreement, they've looked at the evidence, and they made a rational decision. That's one type of consensus, but consensus can also just mean group opinions or group think. In other words, uh, for some non-rational or sociological reason, a group of experts decide that they're going to have a one, take one side in some kind of controversial issue. And so my question in this piece is essentially, okay, if, if you're a non-expert on some scientific topic and you want to know, okay, I, I hear there's a consensus on this topic, uh, when should I feel confident, you know, that, yeah, I think what they're telling me is probably true? And are there conditions under which you should be justified in being skeptical, even if you don't know anything about the details of the science? And, and the this is what I find fascinating in the piece, is you have a list of uh, a series of tells mm -hmm. uh, that indicate that you ought to question the consensus. And, of course, the, the consensus that you've questioned most controversially is the consensus about climate change. Right. Now, you don't doubt that climate change is occurring. No, of course not. And that's, a, I mean, that's sort of the first tell. I say when, when the issue bundles completely unrelated and distinct issues together as if they're all about the same thing. So if people ask, and I've had it, people ask me, do you believe in climate change? Uh, well, what does this mean exactly? Of course. I mean, you know, any place you live, you know the climate changes. Well, there turns out that climate change really is a stand-in phrase for four different issues. And it's, it's really, are, are we in a warming trend globally, right? So is the Earth, is the earth warming over time? Uh, are human beings the primary cause of it? That's a different question. You've got what's happening and what's causing it. That's just logic to distinguish those. Is it bad? In other words, is w the warming that we see, is it on balance a good or a bad thing? That's the normative question. And then you've got the, really the political question. Okay, what policies would actually even make a difference even if all these things were occurring? Very often, though, when you're asked about climate change, you're supposed to sign off on all those four completely different issues. And when, when you try to separate them, as I've discovered myself, you get called a denier. Even if you say, look, I actually think we're in a warming trend. I think that it's quite likely human beings contribute something to the change in the environment in all sorts of ways. 
and I'm open to the possibility it could be bad if it continued, that doesn't tell you anything about whether the Kyoto Protocol or the Paris uh, Climate Agreement would do anything about it. And we need to be able to have a rational discussion. When people want to take an issue, bundle separate issues together as if they're all one question, that's a sign that maybe something's happening. Uh, you also say that another sign is when ad hominem mm. attacks uh, proliferate yes. about people who question the uh, consensus. Have you been subject to some Absolutely. In fact, right now, probably if someone checks my bio at Wikipedia, it's going to probably say I'm a climate denier. I mean, the very right. word uh, denier is itself an ad hominem. Now, of course, in every debate, we're human beings. We have a tendency to attack, to attack the people we disagree with what, rather than our arguments. But when ad hominems are the beginning of the argument, that can be a tell that people don't actually have really good and persuasive arguments that they can present to you. And so you essentially try to demonize the opposition. And if large numbers of influential people can do that, you can essentially kind of silence the dissenting voices. Okay, you, you will agree that on some consensus, is like we were speaking before briefly about yes. the earth is round consensus. That's right. It, it, ad hominem attacks might be appropriate on well, some of the people who are least, questioning it, it that? It certainly makes sense, but it's, we don't even need to do that because there's so many very good arguments, actually very intuitively plausible arguments or this, the, so better this, to yeah. to even avoid. Focus, yes, exactly. Are you crazy. Yeah, th I mean that's the yeah th that's right. And of course there are things like that. But something like climate change, which is what I focus on in this uh, in this piece, climate change is nothing like that. I mean, in principle, does the idea that we have such profound and detailed knowledge what climate is going to do, it's doing now, that we can predict the global temperature 50 years out, does that even sound like the kind of thing on which there could be? certainty in the same way that, say, the shape of the earth could come to, to certainty or our knowledge of chemistry and the makeup of the periodic table. Those are the kinds of things in which you can imagine what experiments and observations would, would make us certain. What's going to happen in the global climate 50 years hence? That sounds like something that is just it's kind of intrinsically uh, something we ought to be tentative about in our conclusions. Okay, one of the other uh, aspects that you say is that when scientists themselves are pressured yes. to tow a party line, that's another indication of it a is. dangerous consensus. That's right. And so how do you, how do you know when you see that? What, one sign is when well-placed scientists, when they become emeritus, in other words, when they retire, suddenly start talking about these things or, so, or suddenly do it when they're in a very safe position. So you don't get too many young scientists that are waiting for tenure talking about these things. You get people like Richard Linson, who's a meteorologist and a climate scientist at MIT, right? A very safe guy in a safe position. Uh, when, when he's senior in his position and can't, you know, really no one can harm him. When scientists suddenly start talking in heterodox ways that are in that position, that's usually a sign that normal science in some ways is break, breaking down. In other words, that the normal type of scientific debate that you ought to have and often do have in science maybe is breaking down. And I think that's, that's absolutely the case if you look at the details around the climate debate. Okay, what about uh, the tell, the indication of a dangerous consensus? Uh, one of them that you describe is when a consensus is widely proclaimed yes. before it even really exists. That's right. I mean, if you look back at the 1970s and the news stories and the cover stories about global cooling at the time, you can pull these up online, stories in Time and Newsweek, they claimed we were going about probably going to move into a new ice age. Immediately, these, the stories say things like scientists generally agree. Okay, in, in fact, that itself, when you hear, rather than this particular scientist argues this, you hear that science says, or scientists agree in the abstract, that itself is usually a little fishy. Or when consensus is, seems to happen right at the beginning. I mean, this happened with Al Gore. As long as he has been talking about this issue, he said there was an absolute scientific consensus. Though later, he spoke about a time 15 years in the past in which there was still a debate. Though if you go back and look at what Al Gore was saying on that date, he had already claimed there was yeah, a consensus. Yeah, he proclaimed the debate was over, yes. I, I think, when he was 15. <laughs> right, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, very early on, he claimed, look, that, you know, no rational person should be arguing about this. Okay, well, that's another indication when, when basically the, isn't it, uh, that, that there, when the whole premise is that rationality demands only one answer. The, the one point that, that I wanted to get to is, mm -hmm. can you think of any predictive um, thrust that, that people could absolutely rely on for 50 years in the future about the, uh, the condition of man? 
No. I mean, that, that's precisely right. The point It's the sort of thing that just doesn't seem to submit to that level of certainty. And then if you actually look at the scientific models that have tried to simulate the future uh, environment, just look at them, pull them up online. There are about 44 major models. They all predict two to three times the rate of warming that's actually being observed. So if we're going to be honest, what that means is that these are crummy models. They're not working. We need to rework them so that they fit the observational data. But what's happening instead is people are preferring the models to the actual observation. That's just not how science is supposed to work. What about the predictions about uh, population growth, unbridled population growth? Uh, how do those look for our long-term future? I mean, it's, it's crazy. This is, we're all hearing this, right? And now even the UN says that by about 2050, the population, human population, is going to level off. So Paul Ehrlich is still somehow managing to get paid with these predictions of, of overpopulation. The, the reality is that if you look at human population, we had exponential growth right at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The reason? People, were, more people could eat, so they didn't die, they survived. And then countries become highly industrialized, and for whatever reasons, good, bad, or indifferent, they start having fewer and fewer kids. That's actually, that's the real worry. And yet, uh, in some ways, the kind of climate debate still creates this hysteria for things like human population growth, which is, if it was ever a problem, it hasn't been a problem for decades. Uh, when the subject matter seems, by its nature, to resist real consensus, yes. that's another indication that you specify for a false and a dangerous consensus. It is. Explain. If, if you're talking about uh, experimental science, what experimental science is about is you set up an experiment under very precise conditions, you run the experiments, and you report both the setup and the results. And in principle, you, you make it public, you publish it in a peer-reviewed journal, and it ought to be replicated, and it ought to be replicatable. Those are the kinds of things on which is, now there's only a few things that will submit to that, that rigor, but we can get certainty when you can do that. When you're talking about the future of the climate, in which virtually all of our knowledge about what the climate is going to do in the future is based not on observations, it's based on computer models that rely for their data on the variables that are plugged in by the scientists themselves. When you are told that there's certainty on something like that that doesn't seem to, to submit to that level of certainty, that should, that's a very strong sign, I think, that you ought to be suspicious. Okay. I think most people can probably agree, based on what you're saying right now, Jay Richards, that uh, some of the false consensus is uh, obnoxious mm -hmm. and uh, it's um, discouraging. Right. But why is it dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because really, if this was just a sort of philosophical debate, right, that didn't touch our day-to-day -day lives, it wouldn't matter. But remember that the reason people are so intense about the climate issue, that they have bumper stickers on their car about the issues, they think, first of all, that the human race uh, uh, is in danger. And what is the proposed solution always? The pro proposed solution is always political control over the economy, increased control at the national level or at the transnational level at the, with the UN uh, of the political machine of the state controlling our everyday lives. And that's always what the proposed solution is. That's very high cost. Now, we want the state to do certain things, but because the state has a, a form of a sort of monopoly on coercion and violence, we want it only to have jurisdiction over certain kinds of things and not other kinds of things. And so, uh, to justify a massive, essentially a massive reworking of the global economy on something that's actually not anywhere near as certain as the, as the supposed experts are telling us, that makes it relevant. That, all, that makes it dangerous and it makes it, 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 it makes it matter to us in a way that, you know, a debate about the nature of some distant star does not. That's an interesting philosophical or scientific question, but it doesn't bear on our day-to-day -day lives. What about, you, you, in your other life, you teach business and yeah. economics. You're a big advocate of free markets. Yes. How can free markets possibly deal with global warming, with climate change, if the uh, non-existent consensus actually is right, that it is catastrophic? Yeah. How is it possible for free markets to cope? Well, this is the, I think this is the real issue. I mean, let, let's just say, let's for the sake of argument, that it is catastrophic and then we're causing it. Then the question is, okay, how would we actually solve this? We're not going to get India and China to quit producing carbon dioxide and building coal-fired plants. And so my question is, okay, so you can either mitigate, right, uh, or you can adapt. No political solution that anyone has ever proposed makes any sense. In fact, the EPA's own estimate, the pre-Trump EPA's estimate, 
of the effects of uh, the Paris Treaty, if it were fully complied with, would be uh, a diminishing uh, amount of, of reduction in warming even 100 years out. So in other words, trillions of dollars uh, for absolutely no effect. On the other maybe, hand, maybe maybe just slowing it by yes, a couple it's of a, months. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, it's essentially it. out at 2100. It's 0.17 degrees Celsius reduction in warming. So we couldn't even detect it. On the other hand, what we do know is that the wealthier you are, the more likely you are to be able to adapt to any kind of change or perturbation. Uh, you know, the wealthy of the, those of us in the West, if the weather gets really bad and the climate in a particular place, we'll just move, right? But the poor in the developing world can't do that. So the poor are always going to be the ones that are most affected by whatever happens. And so my argument, just as the, the, the Danish statistician uh, Bjorn, Bjorn Lomborg argues, is that what we need to be focusing on is development, on helping the rest of the world get as wealthy as we are. Because if the world is much more developed 50 or 100 years from now, we're going to be able to adapt much better to whatever the changes are in the climate or whatever. And I think that's that ought to be the real lesson. Even if you're really, really worried, even if you're a catastrophist, if you look at the real policies that are proposed, they're utterly inadequate. Unless we're actually going to just dismantle modern civilization, what we really need is development. And we know just, just since 1990, over a billion people have been lifted out of poverty in what we used to call the third world, not because of anything the UN did, uh, but because of enterprise, because of property rights, because of widening circles of trade, and because of innovation. Uh, in fact, the UN itself thinks that within 30 years we may eradicate absolute poverty. I think uh, whatever your view on the details of climate change, that's really what we ought to be focusing on. And part of that process involves some of this progress that's very dramatic on desalinization. Yes, absolutely. Because one of the things that people do talk about is water shortages yes. everywhere. So if they could convert seawater... Now, this may, this may sound very simple-minded, mm -hmm. but if you actually ha are having rising sea levels, yeah. but you're able to desalinize, you're able to, yeah. to use a great deal of that seawater, divert it to, uh, for, uh, to watering crops and to of keeping course. people alive, right. doesn't that sort of bode well for dealing with any crisis? It does. And, of course, the thing we haven't talked about, and this is non-controversial, but uh, carbon dioxide is plant food, right? Remember, plants like carbon dioxide. We right. breathe it out, they breathe it in. Uh, just since 1980, in fact, this is a well-established science, we've actually increased the greening of the world, the so-called leaf area index. It's measured by satellites of the Earth about 14%. And it's wait, wait, since 1980? Since, yes, since 1980. This wow. is widely, uh, not widely known, but well understood. In so the what about the disappearing rainforest? Well, we there, the, the, well, you see that, of course, on the edges. That's happening. But even if you look at the leaf area index, and you just, I encourage people to Google this, even the Sahara is shrinking. And most of this is thought to be the result of what's called aerial fertilization. The, the more carbon dioxide essentially in the atmosphere, the better plants do. It's a very well understood process. And so um, there could be negative consequences to increases in carbon dioxide, including the effects on climate. But don't forget that there's also these, these uh, added benefits. And so those are the sorts of things that we, we tend to forget about. It is true, isn't it, that, that the United States is more forested Absolutely. than it was in 1900? Absolutely. And then it was, yeah, this is, I mean, this is the, the, the ironic thing is that the more productive we get in farming, the more land we can use for other things, either allow it to be a wilderness or a, a nature park or whatever. I mean, that's, that, I think that's actually where we're going in terms of agriculture. And so the reality is that in the long term, uh, innovation and efficiency are, are the way to actually preserve the environment and to be good stewards. The problem is there's so much hysteria over this climate change issue that it's, it's really hard to have prudential discussions about what the kind of best policies would be. Well, certainly it's hard unless you recognize that there are dangers to false scientific consensus. If you want to learn more about uh, Dr. Richard's work, if you want to read his essay about how you know when a consensus is false and dangerous, uh, go find it at our website that is... Uh, a website for Great Minds with Michael Medved. The website is mindswithmedved.com. That's mindswithmedved.com. And do uh, find out all about our upcoming programs, our upcoming discussions, uh, because producing this kind of conversation isn't an entirely free process. It is funded by you. So be part of that process. Go to... Uh, mindswithmedved.com and tune in for the very next 
uh, episode of Great Minds with Michael Medved. Thanks for joining us.